Hi and welcome again from us, from me Lawrence and my wife Hetty behind the camera and in this session we are going to look at the rapture theory as preached by so many people what it actually means, is it still applicable or is it not applicable now as we saw in the previous session we went through and discussed consequences or discussed how we as church actually become part of Israel that we become the new Israel that we are inheriting everything that Israel is going to inherit now what is what did it mean to me I think when I look at the Bible and when I started reading the Bible with that in mind it opened up so many new avenues for me, so many things that I was actually at times scared to put the Bible down because I would miss something. So I could read the Bible totally with different eyes, through different eyes, just to see what is in store for us. If we look at the prophets, they talk about so many things that's going to happen. And, <coughs> sorry. We find that people just ignore it and say, <coughs> yes, it was part of the old covenant and yes, it's gone. No, it hasn't. There are so many new things that are still there. Now, I said in the previous one, this chapter, or this session, we will look at the, the popular rapture theory. Now, the whole story, just to give you a put it together in a couple of uh, sentences is based on the th uh, premise that we now live in a period of grace that there's still a week of Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled and that will happen when Jesus will come back he will rapture all the Christians away or the church away from the earth and the Antichrist will come up and reign for three and a half years he will make a covenant with the Jews and then break the covenant and all sorts of weird and wonderful things that you cannot find anywhere in the Bible, unfortunately. And now we find that there's even movies about it. The All Left Behind series is based on that. But there's no scripture that actually confirms that. Because if we look at Daniel's prophecy, and that's what I want to start off with, uh, or before I look at it, why do people actually believe in it? I think it gives them a nice feeling. They don't have to worry about what's going to happen if the rapture happens tomorrow. Because I know it's going to be difficult on earth, so I don't have to worry. I'm going to be raptured away from it, and really, I will be free from everything. I will sit there with Christ and look down and see how everybody is running around on earth and all the bad things that happen to them so I can be comfortable so it's really a comfortable gospel that is being preached whereas if we look at what Jesus says he said those that will continue until the end they will be saved now that in itself to me said that yes I have to look at it and see can I actually continue until the end but let's leave that there. Let's go back to Daniel. What I would like to do is just give you a little bit of background, okay? There was prophecy from Daniel when he was uh, in Babylon and the whole thing is uh, told into weeks, which everybody that interprets the Bible agree that a week in Daniel's prophecy is a year. So even though Daniel said it was 70 weeks, it ended up being 70 times 7 years. So each day ended up being a year. So the first 69 weeks, everybody is more or less in conformance with. It was the time from they came back, or from the time that they came back, until the time that Jesus was born. Because they, it said there will be somebody born, the Messiah will be born. So we can work it out and say, yes, that was 69 weeks. But now we find that the rapture people come and say, that's where it stopped. The last week is all of a sudden not part of the 69 weeks. 
they say we live in a period of grace and only at the end of this period will the 70th week start. So when will it happen? I don't know, according to them. They will say it will be during the rapture. But let's look at what the Bible actually says. Or what Daniel's prophecy actually says. He says in Daniel 9.27 And I will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Oh sorry, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, it sounds very funny. Now he says that after three and a half years there will be a new covenant started or established which will be a very strong covenant. Now, the rapture people say, oh, but that's the Antichrist. He will make a covenant with Israel, the Jews, as it is today. I'm saying, let's look at it slightly different and say, Jesus was, his whole ministry on earth was three and a half years. From the time he started till the time he was crucified was three and a half years. From there onwards till the time that Peter actually started seeing that yes the Gentiles accepted the word and the Lord poured out his Holy Spirit on them that was another three and a half years so to me looking at it that way if I look at why did Daniel see a very strong covenant if we look at what Jesus came to do he said he's not coming to establish something new he's coming to fulfill now what did he actually fulfill? The first thing he fulfilled was the first covenant, the old covenant. And that meant quite a lot of things. He fulfilled the daily offering that had to be done every day. And if we look at what the Hebrew writer says he says Jesus didn't go through an earthly tabernacle he went through an heavenly tabernacle to fulfill every requirement that was put out by the Mosaic law so by Moses' law he fulfilled everything including and I think that's where a lot of people don't even know is he was the firstborn of the father and when the father entered into a covenant with Abram he said to him, take your son Isaac and go and sacrifice him. By that, the father said, if you're willing to do it, I will take my son, which was Jesus Christ, and I will sacrifice him in your son's place. And that is the covenant. So now we can look at it and see that Jesus actually entered into a covenant with the Father because he now comes and he says if you believe in me I or you as a Christian can come to the Father covered by my blood because I was the perfect sacrifice I was accepted by the Father the moment that the veil was rent in the temple that sacrifice was uh, accepted so we can go to the Father without going through any priests but at the same time Jesus was the firstborn and if we remember correctly from the history of Israel all the firstborn sons had to be sacrificed and we read Peter, Paul, everybody saying but the sacrifice is no longer required why? because Jesus also fulfilled that curse that was put on them uh, when they left Egypt that the firstborn if he's not sacrificed will be will die Jesus fulfilled that because he was the firstborn from the father and he also confirmed that so that we don't as men have to be sacrificed or circumcised as the firstborn in order to become part of the covenant because Jesus did that he died for that now what do we see here that the covenant that Jesus entered into with the Father 
is the strong covenant because now anybody who believes in Jesus can become part of this covenant and they can go to the Father they will be acceptable for the Father because he was the perfect sacrifice so we are set free but a lot of people say oh but the sacrifices in the temple only ended around 70 AD after Christ when Jerusalem was destroyed you know what there was no sacrifice required after Jesus died on the cross because he was accepted by the Father so that is why the sacrifice will stop in the middle of the week because that was the time when Christ was crucified now if we look at this reason this there's a couple of other reasons as well if we look at how is it possible when there are laws written down that Jesus can come and put those rules aside because if there was a sacrifice in the temple that day then the father had to accept it because it was according to the law but something happened which I'll show you now what the impact of that is Jesus comes in front of the priest in front of the high priest and he, the high priest said to him and said this fellow said I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days and the high priest arose and said unto him answered thou nothing what is it which uh, these witnesses against thee but Jesus held his peace and the high priest answered and said unto him I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ the Son of God Jesus said to him thou hast said nevertheless I say to you hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven then the high priest rent his clothes saying he hath spoken blasphemy what further need have we of witnesses behold now you have heard his blasphemy now this is a major thing the high priest tore his clothes now if we go back to the Mosaic law again there's something else that they say in Exodus 28 it says these are the garments that they shall make a breast piece an ephod a robe a coat of checker work a turban and a sash they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve me as priest they shall receive gold and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen and they shall make the ephod of, uh, ephod of gold the blue of and purple and scarlet yarns and of fine twined linen skillfully worked it shall have no shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together and the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and be of one piece with it of gold blue and purple so the whole clothing of the high priest had to be made of one piece of linen of one piece of material now when the high priest tore it he could no longer and there weren't spares kept in the cupboard anyway so he could not appear the next morning before the Lord according to the Mosaic laws because the garment that he had to have on must have been from one piece and there could not be a hem in it so the only way he could fix his garment was to fix it by sewing it up so there should have been an M so first point he could not enter that uh, because his clothing was torn now if we look at what happened to Jesus when he was crucified they all said let's tear up his clothes and hand it out to the people that crucified him and they said no don't tear it keep it in one piece and hand it over to the soldiers so Jesus was from one piece that made him his clothing acceptable to the Lord whereas the high priest clothing was not acceptable that is why Jesus could go in and be the perfect sacrifice now we have to remember Jesus was crucified at the exact same time as the morning sacrifice had to be offered 
and he died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was when the afternoon sacrifice had to be done. He hung on the cross for the full time that that sacrifice had to be in the temple. And that is why the writer of Hebrews can tell us that he fulfilled every requirement that was required by the law. Because the other thing as well, Jesus wasn't crucified within the city limits of Jerusalem or within the limits of the temple. He was crucified outside Jerusalem. Now, if we go back and we look at uh, the sort of rules and regulations about crass, uh, rules and regulations about sacrifices, they had to take the offers outside of the town and slaughter it there. And that's where Jesus went. He went outside of town, and that is where he was killed. So he even fulfilled that requirement of that sacrifice. So Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So that is why it, the, the sacrifice stopped in the middle of the week because it was no longer more, no longer required because Jesus fulfilled the complete sacrifice. So that takes care of the first three and a half days that Daniel said. Now what happened in the next three and a half days or three and a half years? We find that the disciples preached the gospel all over the place and everything went perfect except that the Jews didn't want to listen to either Paul, Peter, John there were only a handful of people that actually accepted that Jesus was the Messiah why because if you look at it the Jews still today are waiting for an earthly king to rule over them. That's why they didn't see Christ as the key, as the fulfillment of that sacrifice. Okay, as I said, Israel rejected Jesus because they expected a king to rule over them. They expected a king like David and Saul and all the other kings to rule over them. But the one thing that we find is that the Lord said to Samuel when he went to the Lord and he said Lord, they want a king he said yes but remember they didn't reject you they rejected me as their king so the same thing happened to the Jews then they rejected Jesus because they still wanted a king to rule over them now Daniel also declared that at the end of that week, during the last part of that week, abominations will start and it will continue until the end of time. Now what, what do we find? Yes, we find that Satan is really doing whatever he can to stop people believing in Christ, to stop them becoming part of this covenant nation with the Lord. That is what is happening there. The other thing that happened is Peter and everybody went around and started preaching the gospel first to the Jews that were outside of Israel and then the one day something major happened. Peter saw a vision and he saw and I mentioned it in the previous chapter as well where all of a sudden Peter had to be called out and he had to go and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that were not Jews. And what happened while he was preaching it? Holy Spirit was poured out and they became part of this covenant with the Lord. And that happened about three and a half years after Christ. So that was the time when the gospel went out into the world and was accepted by everybody outside the world. So what about Israel now? I believe that they are part of Edom when we look at the Old Testament prophecies because just like Esau rejected his firstborn right, so did Israel or the Jews reject their firstborn rights as part of Christ. When they rejected him, 
they did the same thing. They were the firstborn of the covenant. But now we as Gentiles, we as church, can become people of the covenant. And we can now live in that covenant. Now Paul says something else. He said, uh, there's a mystery. Now a lot of people that proclaim the rapture theory says, oh, there's a boss, there's a... Uh, mystery in that only we know about this thing that Paul is going and if you don't believe in the rapture you are not part of the people that know something about this mystery but unfortunately for them if you read the whole passage Paul himself himself declares what that mystery is and I want to read it to you he says in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace when he hath abounded toward us all wisdom and prudence, having made known in unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed himself, that in the dispensation of fullness of times he might gather together in all in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even into him. And he continues here and he says, That is the mystery. The mystery is that we as church and Israel are combined into one nation, the nation of the Lord, and that is his mystery. That's not a mystery that you have to be a superhero and be anointed by the Holy Spirit to understand it. No, he says the mystery is we don't know how the Lord is working, but he's now taking this gospel and with his covenant he's making a new nation for him which is the church because there will not be a Roman Catholic heaven and a Presbyterian heaven or a Baptist heaven or an assembly of God heaven no there's one heaven and we will all be with Christ in his church so that is what Paul is saying here that Everybody will be combined in one nation, in one place for him. So to conclude the 70 weeks then, it started with the ministry of Jesus to the Jews and ended when the message of the gospel came to us as Gentiles. Now, something I want to read here from 1 Timothy is, and I think to me it just says where people are and how easy it is to become caught up in something that is not from the Lord. Even Paul says in 1 Timothy from verse 3, he says, As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless uh, genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith for some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion and that is what Paul says that we will find people that are in fruitless discussion that says yes but this is going to happen you know what if I put my head down tonight I know that based on what Jesus said I will end up with him in heaven as soon as my spirit leaves my body I will be with him in a thousand year reign and that is the place where he will reign until he comes to gather those people that believe in him as the final judgment on earth and that is when only after that will we find the big war between Jesus Christ's army and the army of Satan when Satan eventually will have to will be completely destroyed and we will enter into the new Jerusalem so I hope that really that you will have second thoughts about the rapture theory that you would look at Jesus as the perfect sacrifice that he did everything for us to establish a new covenant and that you will 
decide to join the Lord's nation, which is Israel, which is still Israel. It has been Israel all these years, and it will be Israel for the next million years to come, because we are His covenant nation, and He's made a covenant with us, and that is where we will be. I thank you for that, and I want to end off this session for us in prayer again. Father God, thank you so much for being with us today, for being here, Lord, that we can actually discuss your word, Lord, that we can see that you were the perfect sacrifice, that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, that we can actually come to you in his name. Lord, and that we can know that we are your children, that we are part of your covenant, and that we will never, that you will never ever forsake us. As long as we keep our part of the covenant, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. I ask, Lord, that you will be with every person watching me now, that you will have, keep your hands over them, and that you will lead them in the ways of your word. I ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen.